All right, everybody, welcome to NorCal Sports Network. And this is the same hat that Brock Purdy's dad wears. Chat loves it when Marty Lurie comes on. Anytime you lose a game this time of year, when you, you can't go backwards, it's a problem. All right, everybody, welcome on in. NorCal Sports Network. And as the thumbnail says, we've got a topic, a hot topic, and we're going to be talking about the 49ers and specifically Kyle Shanahan. First, start right out of the gate. I'm going to ask you guys, should the 49ers consider trading Kyle Shanahan to stockpile some high draft picks? Sean, what say you? Well, I, uh, I haven't been the biggest Kyle fan for a while. Uh, and then after watching him this year, I just feel like he's not the guy. I just don't think he's the guy. And the tough thing is you, you say, well, who do we put in, you know, who do we, who do we hire? Who do we put in this place? Like the, the Niners had a long history of going through some terrible head coaches, terrible head coaches. And I think uh, a lot of the, the fan base has PTSD from Tom Sula farting at the press conference and farting on the field. <laughs> just, sure did. Uh, just being yeah, an I forgot awesome, about the just being an <laughs> absolute clown show. So I get it. I get it. We finally have a, a, a good coach um, that's taken us really far in the playoffs into two Super Bowls. But at the end of the day, I don't see any, any genius in his play calling. Um, I don't see him uh, as a leader of men. Um, I don't see him like a uh, like a Dan Campbell type and his office has gotten awfully predictable. And uh, I don't think he's the guy. I really don't. And and that's the thing. The tough thing is like, well, who do you, you who do you hire? That's going to be better. I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think Kyle's the guy. And so if this topic is, do, do we need to get rid of Kyle? Did the Niner need to get rid of Kyle? I don't think it would be a bad thing. I think it might even actually help the organization in the long run, because I think everyone's scared to go up against Kyle. I think Kyle has too much power. And uh, I think it's hurting the organization in the long run. So yeah. well, we'll get rid of him. I would trade him. Well, seven times in the history of the NFL, seven coaches have been traded. The most famous ones that we know of are Sean Payton and John Gruden. But back in 1970, Don Shula was actually uh, the Dolphins poached Shula from the Colts before the 70 uh, season. It, was origi- it wasn't originally a trade, but the NFL ruled that Miami violated tampering rules and made the team send a first-round pick to Baltimore. And Bill Barcells in 97, he was traded uh, from his role with the Patriots. The Jets got, got him. And then Mike Holmgren was uh, traded. Seattle got him from the Packers. Remember that one? And then Bill Belichick was uh, in a deal. Uh from uh, the, the the Patriots uh, again, we're involved there. And then John Gruden, of course. Now, the Gruden deal, which was interesting, the Buccaneers gave up two first-round picks and two seconds plus $8 million to the Raiders in exchange for Gruden. And then Herm Edwards was uh, the sixth guy traded. in, in uh, The Chiefs traded a fourth-round pick to the Jets for Edwards. And then um, Bruce Arians was traded. And then, of course, Sean Payton was uh, dealt uh, for a couple of ones. So Payton had retired. Payton retired. He was on TV. And then they traded his contract. Yeah. Right. They still own his rights. Yeah. The the Saints still own his rights. So I was talking about this with you on the phone today, Sean, at about 1.30 this afternoon. It's funny. We're talking about it. I says, you know. Maybe, it was, you know, Sean and I will talk or Los and I will talk. We all get together and talk on the phone. And I'm, I'm like thinking, man, the Niners, <clears throat> they've got to do something moving forward because <clears throat> they're getting old and they're getting old quick. And they got a lot of contracts that are fat and happy guys that – and. You, you know, we're looking at the Rams. We're hearing the Rams are looking at maybe trading Stafford or Cooper Cup. They're talking about that. And being proactive. Be, be yeah. proactive. And we saw Denver. 
when Sean Payton came in, they just said, forget, you know, one year with Russell, they tried it. They said, you know what? We're just going to eat the contract. And I'm thinking, well, the Niners might have to eat some of these contracts and just, but how do they rebuild? What do they have to rebuild? Kyle Shanahan is a valuable commodity to a lot of teams. And, and my first thought was the, uh, the owner of the New York Jets, Allen. I don't know what his, I always want to call him Woody Allen. What's his first name? <laughs> but I don't remember what his first name is, but oh, I'm please. Myself, this guy just fired Sala, Robert Sala, and said it was his decision. And the team looks awful. They're not going to compete. They're not going to beat uh, Baltimore, Buffalo, or Houston, or Kansas. Not Allen. It's Johnson. Woody Johnson. Yeah, well, Woody. Okay. No, oh, that's why I get it out. Al, Woody Allen. Woody yeah. Johnson. Okay. Well, I knew <laughs> that's why I'm thinking Woody. Woody, yeah, Woody Johnson. Um, he's a There's... guy. You might be able to say, hey, uh, how about the number one commodity that everybody seems to have wanted, except, you know, Maybe the Niners can get a couple of ones, one this year in 25 and another one in 26. And and uh, and, and then who would you bring in if, if that actually was to happen? I mean, there's talk about uh, Ben Johnson, who's the yeah, hot guy for a little while. Detroit. <laughs> what I are you mean, mumbling about down there? <laughs> oh, I've, I've, I've been talking about Ben Johnson for a couple of years right now. Um, so he's the he's the hot name, and he turned down a couple of uh, opportunities last year because he's waiting for uh, a high profile organization like the Niners. That he doesn't want to just go to a team that doesn't have talent. He wants to go to a team that still does have talent. Niners still do. Um, let's see how some of these younger players work out. But uh, Tony Dungy is a perfect example of a guy that he couldn't get the team past you know a certain point, and they traded for Gruden, and they instantaneously won a Super Bowl. Look, even successful coaches like Kyle, the locker room is going to tune you out. It's about hey, Bill eight Walsh. Bill Walsh, uh, after so many years, was he took John Madden's advice, and John Madden said, after ten years, you've you're you're pretty much you you can't keep the guys can't get these guys motivated after yeah. ten years. Eight to ten years is, and Kyle's at eight. He's lost some some heartbreaking games, and the talent on the roster, especially the veterans, they see, hey, they see what we see. They're not oblivious to it. They're not going to say it in front of a microphone. They know how those Super Bowls went down. They know how that Rams NFC championship went down. You know, think about this. Patrick Mahomes in the two Super Bowls in the game last week has thrown five interceptions against the Niners. Five. They did their job. That should but be a loss. Off- the, those mean. two of those threes should have been wins, at least well, yeah, two. wins for the Niners, losses for the Chiefs. And and none of them are wins because the offense couldn't do anything and because the special teams let them down every single time and they don't address that. So I personally think that Kyle lost a little bit of the locker room after this last Super Bowl. And I think what he did to Purdy this a this, uh, couple days ago, like he talked down to a guy that is not going to argue back. How do you know he and, talked down to him? Well, there was a lot of reports saying that he used a lot of, you know, hand motions and his, you know, you know, you could read body language and see that he was kind of scolding him, if not yelling at him. And Purdy is, uh, is, is, you know, playing the good soldier and he's not going to say anything back. Shanahan wouldn't go up to Trent Williams and talk crap to him about why he punched a guy. Hell no, he wouldn't do that. But he decided to talk down or maybe whatever happened, say it to the one guy that can't really defend himself because, you know, he doesn't have the big contract yet. And, and he's just, it's just not in his nature. Even Jimmy G might have fired back. So I think Kyle has been slowly losing that locker room. And, you know, we're here to discuss today about the possibility. And it's not just the Jets. The Jaguars probably could use a good coach. Uh, the Raiders could use a good coach. And here's the sleeper. What if the Dallas Cowboys offer all the time stuff? They have been looking to move off of Mike McCarthy for a while, and Jerry is getting up there. No, he already is up there, and that would be a huge splash to get Kyle Shanahan. I How think much better would. is Kyle than, than Mike McCarthy, though? Well, well to the that, rest of the league. They both, they both are terrible at clock management. Agreed. Both- to the rest of the league, though, they, they still you know think Kyle is a top-five coach, and – 
And we who have seen him over the last eight years have slowly seen his flaws and things that he will not change on. He so might be a top there. five coach. He might be. A I top think. Five. I think he is probably a top five yeah. coach. But uh, his flaws are huge, and his flaws are causing them to not win. Well, yeah, he's I not a coach. He's not a coach that I would get for one game. I could name ten to twelve other coaches that if I, if you ask me, Los, what coach do you want for one game to win a Super Bowl? Kyle would not be in the top ten because. I've seen his game plans. I've seen how vanilla they are. There are probably 10 other coaches that now for the long, for a long season. Yeah. He's a top five coach, but for one game, I have seen enough of his do, play calling. Do you I've think he's a leader of men, Lowe's? No, he's not accountable. When have you ever seen Kyle Shanahan admit that he made a mistake? Never. He's been challenged in, in not often. This is not the East coast. I would love Kyle to be coaching in Philadelphia or New York. That media would hold them accountable. They'd say, Kyle, what the hell? Why don't you run a two a two minute drill? Like every coach in any high school, college, professional level runs a two minute offense. How can you possibly not run that since you've been here? And and I want to hear what the answer is, but nobody asked him that. It, wouldn't that be something to hear? Because you know, you think about this, Los. They were they ran the two minute offense at the end of the game, and they scored just under the two minute mark. But with 10 minutes to go, they were down two scores to the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes. And he was taking his time in the huddle. And not only were they just huddling up, but Kyle takes 5, 10 seconds to figure out which play to call. Then he reads it off the play to Purdy. Then Purdy looks at his wrist of plays and reads the play, which takes about six to eight seconds to get the full play read. And by the time the team breaks the huddle, there's 10 seconds left on the play clock. They get lined up. Then they go in motion because there's one or two guys always in motion almost every play. And they're snapping the ball with two seconds, one second left on the play clock, down two scores. And I'm thinking, and you still got to go 80 yards to get one score. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm just sitting there watching this game and yelling Sunday, like, hurry up, hurry up. Because not only do you have to score, which is odds are you haven't scored that much. So if you do break the odds and, and do score, now you got to hold Mahomes down and get the ball back. And that's not an easy score task. Him. So the fact is, you know, you were down at that point. 20 uh two scores whatever it was 21 10 at the time i think it was right 21 no 12 21 12 and they got it down there and then they got the interception in the end zone and then kansas city took it all the way down scored made it 28 12 and then they got the cheapy touchdown when they went into the two minute drill but had they 21 to 12 and got, took it down and let's say they scored the TD and it made it 21 to 19 and then the Chiefs come back and they do drive the ball and they do eat up six minutes of the clock and get a field goal you still have a chance to come down and score and win but that's only if you hurry up you can't you can't just take your time and think the Chiefs are going to do three and out. That's not going to happen. He ran a Who's two middle when the game was out of reach. Yeah. So like it doesn't make any sense. But yeah, I'm going to ask both of you guys because this is one of my biggest, you know, uh, uh, peeves about Kyle is, is his lack of growth, his lack of growth as a coach. I'm going to give you guys six quick things and you tell me, honestly, in your opinion, in eight years, has he grown in the following areas? Number one, Allowing his quarterback to audible. Has he grown in that aspect? <laughs> no. Or is he still the same? Number two, we just talked about it, running a two-minute offense. I think I know the answer to that. Number three, clock management. Has he grown on that? Has he gotten better on that? No. It looks. I would say no. It's pretty bad. Number four, his conservative nature, going for an extra point rather than a two-point, playing it safe and kicking field goals. Has he gotten more aggressive? over eight years, or is he still conservative by nature? Still conservative by nature. I watched 
on Monday Night Football, Jim John Harbaugh up by 17 points in the second half, and he gets it down to fourth and four, basically fourth and four, almost fourth and goal it might have been, but it was fourth and four. He could have kicked the field goal and went up 20. He put his foot on the gas and says, no, we're going. And he got the TD and he went up 24 points, basically saying, you know, F you, this game, I'm not, this game's over. Yeah. Yeah. And Kyle would have never done that. Never. He would have kicked the field goal and went up 20 and allowed possibly the team to come back, score three scores and lose by one. How about how about then, Ross? How about Ross? Well, 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 I have a, I have a, a point of that. So I, yeah, I think right. I think um, in along the same vein as what you're saying, it's also flow of the game, right? Like right. a feel, a feel for the game, a feel for the game. Yeah. When when to go for it, even if it, even if the number like the analytics, like even if the analytics say go for it, and you're like, no, nah, I don't really think we're we're not moving the ball real well, we're not running the ball, we can't get four yards or whatever it is. It's the flow of the game. And I feel there's so many times where I'm watching these games and like take that two point conversion in the last game. Like he should have gone for two to tie it at 14, but he's like, momentum. the book says to go for two. Everyone thinks I'm going to go for two. You know what? I'm going to do what I think is right. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think outside the box. I'm just going to go for, you know, try to try to, you know, try to kick it. And it didn't end up working out. Like, you know, your, your kicker, you're in your third kicker for a reason because your special teams is horrendous because you won't fire the coach. You won't make any changes. And so you're on your third kicker because your first two kickers had to make tackles that they shouldn't have had to make. And that kicker has missed five extra points in that. Last in year. Game. Like you should know all this shit, but it's more of like feel for the game. You know, like yeah. I feel like he's always trying to either outthink the opponent or outthink everyone and show how smart he is. And it causes a lot of problems in my opinion. So the last, no. the last two categories yeah. are, we've talked a little bit about it, is being accountable. Has that changed in eight years? <laughs> yes, I've never heard him once take accountability. No. Okay. I haven't, I haven't. So, so, he's, so he's 0 for 5 in, in you know, growth. And the last one is roster politics. That could mean a lot of different things, like playing guys that maybe shouldn't be starting and keeping some young guys that have more talent on the bench. Um, it's a huge it's problem. problem. It's funny. Last year, he told all of us that Jordan Mason wasn't ready. And Jordan Mason could have cut into McCaffrey's carries and he couldn't have killed him where he actually might have been a little healthier in, in the Super Bowl. And uh, to me, Mason would have been ready. This year, Jacob Cowing is not ready. Jacob Cowing looks to have the only be the only guy on the roster that has speed and quickness at wide receiver and can separate. Watch him ball out this weekend. I bet he will. I, I might bet he will. Him. I might pick him up on gonna, fantasy. They're <laughs> not going to make a trade. They're going to make a trade. They shouldn't. Before, before they shouldn't Sunday. Because we'll, the, we'll same guy, the same guy is going to be calling the offense. Yeah, we'll I get into the done. into that trade thing. You know, it's interesting. I wanted to, you know, we're, we, we talked about here, you know, the top of the show, trading Kyle. And it's funny because, like I mentioned, we were talking at 1.30, and Sean and I, and I, I brought this up, and then, I heard Ryan Hensley bring it up tonight on their show with Grant and Jesse and the coach. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't want Ryan to think we actually got to stealing his idea. No, Ryan, we, we talked today at 1.30 for about a half hour about this. So <laughs> he was not And to hear, hear him say it, I was just like, oh, my goodness, that was great. No, it, but, it makes absolutely but no good sense. Minds- yeah, to fire that. Kyle. If you can get a couple first-round picks, no, my yeah, God, you why never- would you not do that? Yeah, you, no reason to fire him. You know how many how many years he has left on his deal? Probably four or five, right? No way. No. Really? Didn't I, he sign a new six year deal a couple years ago? I think he's got three years left. Oh, you should one thousand percent trade him. Yeah, I would absolutely. If somebody offered me two first rounders, I might even take one first rounder. I take a first and a third. First yeah, and a second. because. Because they just need a new voice. They it, it would be refreshing. I think. I think if you I, shopped him around, you can get two ones for him. I really do because he's highly thought of. I mean, if you listen to the national media, I mean, we as 49er uh, followers and fans, you know, we're see so much more of some of the things that you just talked about. Those six uh, growth factors and some of the decisions. You know, I've been a Kyle's fan. I I've never felt like they should just fire him. I think he's an 
excellent coach, but I'm starting to see I don't think he's the right coach to get these guys over the top because you cannot – you've got to give your quarterback – I mean, you can't tell me that he's smarter than Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh let Steve Young and Joe Montana audibleize. Uh, I don't know of a coach in football that has that much control where you don't let – trust your quarterback to go to the line – and say, oh crap, the call you just gave us is not gonna work. And but we're gonna and go ahead and run he's it a anyway. smart dude. He, he's he a is smart a smart dude. dude. He's Absolutely. Dumb. You don't think he pretty audibleized at Iowa State. My goodness. Yeah, he, every every quarterback who is an analyst on TV has said Purdy can see the field, go through his reads probably quicker than anybody. He he and that takes that takes smarts. Like he's a smart dude. He could easily figure out what defense he's looking at because the, the if, if anyone's listening at home, the green dot on the back of the helmet shuts off. So he gets the play call from Kyle and then it shuts off. It's not like there's a two-way communication with your coach and you get to the line and you're like, oh, that play's not going to work. Well, I can't audible, so I'm gonna have to run this play that's not gonna work. That's just what happens with the Niners. Other quarterbacks, you know, the top ones like Joe Burrow audibles. You know, clearly. Oh, and, Kyle's, and, prob- and, Kyle's problem is not that he's not smart; it's that he has a ridiculous ego. It's and control, not and and he's a control maniac. Did you guys know that he has a, a bugs in every coach's office, and he listens into every coach's meetings, special teams, defensive. He wants to listen on every meeting. I will send you guys an article after this. Um, a link that shows that he's done that going back to his uh, Atlanta uh, Falcons days. Now well, he's the head do, coach. So we saw it last year in the, uh, I don't know if it was the NFC championship game or one of the playoff games. He told Steve Wilkes, he didn't like the way the call he was making. He, and he, and he called a timeout. You know, who'd right? give two, you know, who'd give two first. I just thought of this, you know, you know what team would give two first. Um, the Raiders or the Cowboys. No. New York Giants? No. It's in the same division. It's, it's in the same uh, conference. Same conference? They desperately want a really good coach. They have the they have all of the parts to be a really good team, but they need a, they need a better coach. The Eagles? No, that guy's such a dick. <laughs> such well, a they got guy. an idiot for a coach. Yeah, no, not not Sirianni. Are you thinking um, Arizona? Let me tell you. Arizona, yeah. Tampa, Tampa, Chicago Bears, and Uber Flus. Oh, oh! I have I have a couple of good friends that are massive Chicago Bears fans, and they're not sold on Uber Flus at all. And Uber Flus is not that good of a coach. He's okay, but they got the quarterback. They got a killer defense. That I mean, that would be they would. Yeah, they you would, got you got the you got the quarterback, and you got Odunze, the receiver, and then they would give up two first. For, for and then chance. they also um, they got um, uh, drawn a blank now. The Chargers receiver that went to Cal. Um, uh, okay. he went oh, to, oh, used to be with the Chargers. Yeah, uh, last year. Uh, drawn a uh, blank. Allen, Allen, Allen. Yeah, Keenan Allen. Keenan, Keenan Allen. Allen. Yeah. Yeah, they got Keenan Allen. They got Odunze, and they've got. I mean, those two first aren't going to be very high. Like, I would rather trade them outside the conference to the Jets, and get those first round picks. The Jets' first round picks versus the Bears. The Bears are going to be good for a while. They're going to be low. They're going to be back end of the rounds. Right. Yeah. But uh, you know, trading makes the most sense because teams would love to get Kyle, and because a lot of teams. Like you said, uh, Sean. I'm going to text my Bears fan right now and see what he says. They don't have the um, the coach, but they've got some of the players in place, but they just don't have the coach to get – you know, Kyle's a very talented coach, and I think sometimes – I really do think this. Los, you're in management. I've been in management, and there is a certain point when you're managing a team that they you lose the edge – of being able to motivate that team. They've heard it over and over and over again, your spiel. Yep. And yep. I used to be a hard driver on my sales teams, but you know what? I got great results for two, three years. And then guys would just, you know, my style was, I got the results and the numbers, but it was hard to keep 
maintaining it with the same crew, you'd have to bring in new blood because they couldn't couldn't take it. Maybe you're right. Maybe some of these older guys have been with Kyle for a long time. Oh, I, I think they've halfway they're, checked out, I, I think. And again, they're not going to say it in front of the camera. No. They're not. But behind closed doors, amongst themselves, they hear what he has to say and his motivation. They'll be like, no, man, we, we don't believe you. Like in the biggest moment, your game plan stink. You do not do what it needs to do. We did our job on defense. We did our job. We held down homes. You didn't do your job. And to make it worse, you were not accountable. You didn't say, oh, I could have did better. You don't think that weighs on the players? The one thing that cracks me up, and nobody discusses this, Kyle gets all the credit for turning this team around. It has nothing to do with Lynch, nothing to do with Adam Peters, who was also in personnel, and nothing to do with the talent of the team. The talent. You know, everybody's worried about going back to Tom and Sula and Chip Kelly. The talent started to go down when those coaches came into play. Now, I'm not saying that they would be better than Kyle, but I'm just saying that Kyle gets 90 to 95% of the credit for turning this around. You don't even hear about Kyle didn't trade for Trent Williams. Kyle's philosophy is I don't believe an offensive line is a priority. It took John Lynch and Adam Peters to trade for an all-pro tackle to help them out. Kyle also likes to have all kinds of different running backs back there. John Lynch traded for Christian McCaffrey. So when I hear all this rhetoric about Kyle is the reason this team is successful, and if he leaves, we're just going to go back to winning five or six teams, it's a crock. It is an absolute crock. Right. Okay, so here's the question. Let's say after this year, it's obviously not going to happen during the middle of a season, but let's say the Niners fall short and, you know, in all likelihood, it doesn't look like their year. Although the NFC is weak this year. If, if you're picking a year to try and sneak in when you, maybe you don't deserve it because you're not as that good compared, you're not dominant like you were in 2019 and last year. This year, the NFC is very weak. It looks like to me, Detroit is the top. And then you've got a couple other teams in the NFC North that are pretty tough in Minnesota and Green Bay. But the NFC East doesn't scare me. I mean, you got Washington and Philly. The NFC South, you really don't. I mean, Tampa just lost two receivers last night. Chris, Chris Godwin for the year. And um, Mike Evans. Mike Evans is out till after week eleven, so the Niners will actually face them in a few weeks, coming off their bye, minus Godwin and Mike Evans. So the Niners should be able to beat Tampa. There's no reason the Niners cannot finish as the third seed this year. The third seed being the third best division winner. They'll have a better record, I think, than – and they could even finish second if things fell their way with Washington, depending on what Washington and Philly do. But it's a weak NFC. So my point being, I still don't think they get past Detroit this year. No one's and, getting past Detroit. And I, and, and I think they would even struggle if they faced Green Bay – and possibly Minnesota. Oh, they're going to, they would have, if things keep going the way they are, go and they do squeeze in the playoffs and they play Green Bay on the road, you got to remember something. And, and this is no shade of Brock. No, Brown. they wouldn't play Green Bay on the road if Detroit wins the division. Okay. So let's say they finish with the third seed and they win their first round game. They might yeah, they, face they a would, Green they, they might get them at home. Yeah. They might face a Green Bay or a Minnesota or Philly or Washington, something like that at home. They win that game. Then they're going to have to go on the road and face uh, whether it be a Washington, Philly, or a Detroit, however that works. But that's going to be the tough part. Let's say the Niners don't make it. And you trade – and you do trade, Kyle, in the offseason. You get uh, two ones, one this year and one next year. Where are you draft – what are you going to shore up on the on the Niners – what so positions? Before we get into it, I just I just talked to my buddy Jimbo. Okay. Lifelong Bears fan, grew up in Chicago. Um, 
in the Chicago area, currently lives in uh, in Palm Desert. Um, so I gave him, the, gave him the whole scenario. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, I think you guys might need a better coach. I mean, Uberflus, you've already, you said multiple times Uber, Uberflus is not the guy. And I said, you got the quarterback now. You got a killer defense. You got some offensive pieces. Uh, you probably could use an upgrade of the coach. He's like, I don't want to trade any picks. He's like, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. He's like, I, they're talking about trading for Max Crosby. Like they're talking about all kinds of stuff in Chicago. And he's like, I don't want him to trade anything. I want him to hold on to those picks. We're going to have a high pick from Carolina. He's like, I don't, I wouldn't trade anything. So I'm probably the wrong guy, but you know, definitely not two ones. He's like maybe a one and a third. Okay. Uh, I was trying to get him to admit to a one and yeah. to, to agree to a one and third. And he still wasn't ready to agree to that. He's like, I'll think about it. I'll text you. Sean negotiating already. As we do this show, show, he's already got Kyle ready to go. Yeah, uh, got his back if, if he's on his could, way out. If I could kind of like just, get back into the whole how important is coaching to a team and how how much of a percentage does a coach get credit for a team winning, being dominant, all that. Let me ask the two of you, and this is a very rhetorical question. In your opinion, who's a better coach, Bill Walsh or George Seifert? Walsh. Sean? Walsh. Okay. The two best teams in 49er history, arguably, are the 89 and the 94 teams. Seifert. Coached by George Seifert. Yeah. Right. So that's my point. Talent matters. Talent yes. matters. Of it freaking matters. Yeah. Kyle has had a loaded roster for the last five years. And, and people think that, that, oh, it's all because of him. They have all kinds of all pros. And let me give you a history lesson on coaches leaving. 1988 was Bill Walsh's last year with the Niners. He Correct. was burned out. He won the Super Bowl. Everybody knows last second touchdown to John Taylor. He retires and he quits. Let me tell you, and me and Dan know this because we're older and we lived it. The narrative going into the 89 season is what are the Niners going to do without the great Bill Walsh? That was the narrative. That was the clippings. That was the stories. How are they going to keep successful without a genius head coach? Seifert's cool, but he's not Bill Walsh. Guess who heard all that noise? The roster, yeah. the talent. I've seen documentaries where the talent, Many different players said we were tired. We love Coach Walsh, but we were sick and tired of him getting all the credit about winning, and it wasn't us. So when we went to the '89 season, we had a chip on our shoulder. We had a chip <laughs> on our shoulder, and there was no more dominant team, in my opinion, in NFL history than that '89 team. This is their playoff wins: Minnesota 43-17, Rams 30 to three. Denver, who had the number one defense in football that year and a Hall of Fame quarterback, kind of like Kansas City, number one defense in football and a Hall of Fame quarterback in John Elway, and they whooped their ass 55, 55 to 10. 10. Yep. That, now, that was a roster that was very motivated. So if you do move off of Shanahan, you don't think all these players that they have are going to be motivated because they're going to hear it just like in 89. How I just feel like he'll be without, invigorated. I feel how like are we going to win without Kyle? He's everything. And now it's social media, so it's everywhere. They're going to hear that all off season. And I'm telling you, this roster is going to have a big F you to everybody and say, we can win without that guy. We win That's, because a lot of reason because of our talent. You're totally right. But that, I mean, this is what we're talking about is, is so ridiculous because it takes the owner. Kyle is at the, at the second level of this whole entire organization. John Lynch isn't going to, it doesn't have the, the capability to do this. It has to come from Jed York and Jed York. I don't know. I don't think Jed York has the stones. I don't either to, to pull that trigger. I get, he doesn't, he doesn't have, he doesn't, he's not like a, he's not that type of owner, right? He's not like a Jerry Jones where he's just like, he's on a local po like news station every week, ripping his team and ripping his coach. And he's not like that. You haven't, I haven't heard from John Jed well, York in years. Well, you know, it's interesting what? you bring up Jed York because, you know, uncle Eddie, probably the most gregarious, lovable owner for the players that maybe has ever existed. The players loved Eddie. Every year, they, whether win or lose, they would take that team and the wives or girlfriends to Hawaii or whatever, every, full trip paid for, and Eddie would spend, this is the days before the salary cap, though, but Eddie would treat his players like there was a player, um, Jeff, um, was it the safety? Is it uh, Jeff Fuller. Fuller, Fuller, 
got injured and, you know, Eddie took care of him for the rest of his life with payments, even when the NFL wouldn't because he didn't make his pension. Set up this an annuity is, for him for life. Set up an annuity for this man for life because he was badly injured. Who does players, lo players loved Eddie. But you know what Eddie also did? He got rid of Ronnie Lott. He got rid of Joe Montana. He got rid of Jerry Rice early because he wanted to keep winning. And he didn't hold on to players that were getting into their 30s and getting long, you know, in the tail where they were not going to be as productive. Even he got rid of them maybe a year too early rather than a year too late. And this was before the salary cap. Right. So he could have kept them. Yes. And Eddie was very emotional towards his players and had and the a players great still love him. Feeling. But it was business for Eddie and business for Walsh. And unlike Kyle, who wants to keep getting players paid instead of doing what's actually best for the team, sometimes you got to let guys go when they're on the decline. And that's why the Niners had a dynasty for 18 years is because they kept letting go of the older players. They drafted very well in those years. So yeah. they had replacements grooming for a year and two. So, yeah, it's a, it's an absolutely different philosophy uh, than what Kyle and, and Lynch has. Which but isn't is that on. isn't that interesting, though, how Eddie was loved and the players still love him and respect him. And when they have reunions, you know, Eddie, everybody adores Eddie. But he also those players knew that, you know, he didn't he wasn't taking them till the very end. And that the team would just crumble because they got too old. He kept replenishing. I mean, how tough of a decision was it to go with Young over Montana? That was a huge, tough decision. But the the Niners made it because Montana was, you know, getting older. And Steve Young was the up-and-coming superstar. And Niners made tough decisions. And, and you know, the Niners... We just saw Brandon Ayuk, unfortunately, get, you know, a devastating injury that was really gruesome. And he's probably not going to come back until November, December of next year. And, and who knows if he'll be the same. History says they lose something and they're not the same. History, history tells us but, they'll be the same. But, well, but this is the point. The Niners could have let him go, or they had the control, they could have said, we're not budging off the 30, off our 24, 25 million offer. We know that guys just signed and the numbers have gone up, but we can't do it. We can, but we refuse to do it because it goes against our plan. Here's the options. You can take the 24 million that we're offering and go with that, or you could be traded or you can play on your fifth year option. And you know what? You might just end up next year being franchise tag too. But no, the Niners cave in yep. and they let it destroy their entire camp and off season. And it was, what was the talk every day through the season? It was all about Ayuk, Ayuk, Ayuk. Huge distraction. And huge distraction. And now they've he's got him. He's there. Like he, he he didn't hold out. He was holding in. He was yeah. there. So and, and 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 they should have just like moved off of him. I mean, you could if you play poker, you could tell he was there because he didn't want to get fined. So money was important. You could have just brought his bluff and said, you know what? Here's our here's the offer. Take it or leave it. Or you know what? Don't come out here to practice. You're not welcome on the team. We're not going to fine you. But step away, you know. You're they, and they would have been fine without Ayuk, honestly, because they spread the ball around. They don't have yep. a number one guy that they gets don't. 10 to 12 targets. So why are you going to give a guy $30 million who one week is going to catch three passes and another week is going to catch six passes? It's just like awesome. I'm telling you, how many times have you seen under Kyle's leadership a guy that was on the bench and somebody gets hurt and becomes the Heliot Ramos of the Giants? Like this this weekend, like me and Sean were talking about, it's going to be Jacob Cowing. Watch. That kid's going to play well, and Niner fans are going to be like, where the hell has he been? Just like Jordan Mason last year. Where has he been? Why has he been sitting on the bench all this time? He takes an injury, 
for somebody that has talent to step up because this is what Kyle and some of the other coaches say as well. Well, he's just not ready. That's all they say in the press conferences. Well, he's just not ready. Oh, but Brendel at center and McKivitz and Campbell at linebacker, they're ready. No, they're crap, but they keep playing. And that's so the bad. roster politics that I'm talking about. You're so, going to keep – so the other guys, the veterans on the team are going to see this and say, Nick Bosa goes against McKivitz in practice. You know what he's thinking. is like, damn, how the F is this guy starting? He's crap. So the players see that, and they're saying, why are these guys starting and these other guys – we're pretty good on the bench. Do I see a little, uh, little uh, resemblance of Farhan here? A little, a little, <laughs> a little Farhan. You know, like you know, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run Austin Slater on the team. I'm gonna start him every other day. Yep. The tuning Austin Slater. Who cares if he's hitting a buck twenty one? Who cares? Yep. He's Austin Slater. I have to keep him on the team. Oh, he's hurt. Oh, looks like I got to bring up Ramos, and then he's our all star. Very yeah. similar. Speaking of Eddie DeBartolo, would he have fired Kyle by now or traded him? Uh, he wouldn't put up with constant losing. See, I think the thing that the big games. I think the, I think the thing people have to remember, like they compare Harbaugh to, to Kyle a lot. If you look at Harbaugh and his three straight losses, they were all in different ways. Wasn't so, Seifert fired? Yes, he was after winning yeah. two Super Bowls. Right after but winning Har two Super Bowls. Harbaugh lost against the uh, against the Giants with the Kyle Williams fumble and the Ahmed. Uh, uh, Bradshaw, uh, forward progress, totally bogus call. Lost in the Super Bowl to the Ravens, uh, getting out, you know, behind, came back, almost won that game, and then to the Seahawks and probably one of the worst officiated game I've ever seen in my life. He lost in three different ways. Kyle's, all his losses, it's the same plot. It's the same story. And that's why I think well, Eddie would have you, said, yeah. you're losing in the same way. You're getting up 10. You're not adding to a lead, and you're not able to do anything in the third and fourth quarters. I would love games. to look at the other stats of other coaches. The stat came out the other day that the 49ers under Kyle Shanahan are, are 0 and 40 when trailing by eight points or more in the fourth quarter. 0 and 40? Why is that? How is that even possible? I don't know. How that's, is that? That's possible? a ridiculous stat. I would fire him just for that. Yeah, if you, if you can't bring teams from behind. Yeah, like you have to be able to do that in the NFL. If you can't do that, then you're not our coach. I think the thing that really, when I the more I think about this, the one thing that is holding the team back is the play calling. The We talked about it earlier the inability for Purdy or who's ever quarterbacking to make changes at the line of scrimmage to the play. Because if you're going to just run your plays and the defense, I mean, Spagnola has his number, period. We didn't see one little dump off pass to the backs last Sunday. No backs, no, Brian no Flores screens. Has his number two. You know, you know, what's a perfect example of the stubbornness of, the, of doing the play my way, Dan, I'll tell you which play it was. The interception where he overthrew Ronnie Bell on the yeah. sidelines. Okay. That play was probably designed to go 10 yards and out. That's how Kyle has it written in his playbook. That's how Purdy is supposed to do it. Purdy threw to an area, not to a player. He threw to – this is Kyle's offense, and it's supposed to go 10 yards out, so I'm throwing to an area. But what happened was – is the wide receiver Bell saw that the corner was playing in that area anyway, so he cut it off a little shorter. So right. instead of improvising and throwing to the player at six or seven yards, uh, Purdy threw to the area that the play called for. Look at and that play had, again. Look at yeah. that play again. And if it you had a so better obvious. offensive, if you had a better offensive line with just two, three tenths of a second extra protection, you'd have time to adjust and, and wait for that break. Instead, he has to throw it on a timing uh, play because he's being constantly pressured. Another another piece of evidence about Kyle's ego, he actually turned down Tom Brady wanting to come here. He actually chose Jimmy Garoppolo to be the quarterback of the 49ers when Tom Brady wanted to come here, won a yeah. Super Bowl Tampa Bay. Why did he turn Tom Brady down? 
What would Tom Brady do if he was a quarterback of the Niners and Kyle tried to play ego with him? What would happen? <laughs> and Brady did. He also Brady would tell he him refused, to, to he also go refused, to hell. He also refused to uh, scout Patrick Mahomes because he thought he was going to get Kirk Cousins. I'm right. telling you, we could do a whole show for two or three hours of all the mistakes Kyle made that were swept under the rug. Yeah, because he's moved walked. up to draft Dante Pettis. Yeah, he drafted Joe Williams. Who Joe went Williams, on his college first draft. Yeah, he drafted Trey Sermon. He drafted TJD Price. He actually liked CJ Beathard. I could go on and on and on. He, yeah, well, how about he gave up three picks for Trey Lance? Yeah, that's my the, point. Uh, like, uh, the linebacker uh, from Ruben, Alabama, Ruben Foster. Uh, Foster. Foster. Ruben Foster. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. And, if you look, if you look at the first couple of rounds, which I, I think I've said this before, which I think that Kyle and John have their little mitts in other than Bosa, who was kind of like a no brainer at two. Right. I mean, the back end of the drafts are where the majority of the quality players have come from for the Niners, Kittle or Fred Warner. Like those are two hall of famers that came in the back end of the draft. Now Kyle and John will take credit for it. Oh, we, you know, we do the whole draft. I don't think they do the whole draft. I think they do the first couple of rounds. And if you look at the first couple of rounds for the last six years, seven years, they've not been good. They really have not. They've gotten a couple of players. That I think Debo was like a second round pick. Second rounder. Yeah, second yeah. rounder. Uh, Bosa was a, was a first rounder. But well, that's, that's what I'm hearing, Sean, is that Kyle and, and, and John, mainly Kyle, they get their choice in the first two or three rounds. And then the scouts get rounds four. Yeah. There and you later. go. And they what have they, they hit? Well oh, they've hit on the later rounds. So, again, you would think that, again, this is what I went back to my notes. What growth has he had? I, I am a person, I don't know about everybody else, but whether it's a coach, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, a boss, I like myself, I like people that learn from their mistakes. I like people that acknowledge that this was wrong and I'm not going to do it again. And this is why I'm so hard on Kyle, because I see him not coming off of his mistakes and continuing to do the same things over and over. And if he hasn't done it in eight years, guys, He's not going to do it. No, at all. I don't think at he's because he's got too he's much power within the organization. Hey, Paul mm -hmm. Walsh was even removed with his presidency after he lost to the Vikings in '87, right? Dan Eddie right, right. stripped him of that, and Bill yeah. Walsh was very successful up until that point. Yeah, but he he's held good. him accountable, and nobody does that to Kyle. Nobody. Yeah, he held him accountable. Walsh came back one more year, won it, and then said goodbye. Adios. And so, what would it take? What would it take for the for for this pressure to turn up. I mean, you said before we came on air, Lowe's, that you're hearing this all over, that the pressure and the heat's turning up a little bit. Is this, you think his seat's actually getting hot? And what would it take for, I mean, we know what it took for, for the Giants to fire Farhan. It took us like two years, two, three years of, of hammering the point home right, every right. single night. I don't, I don't think the heat's going to be high enough this year. I don't see it happening because what if they don't make the, what if they don't make the playoffs? Well, just blame the injuries. They'll they'll blame the injuries. They'll blame you know Probably. CMC was out and we lost Ayuk and we you know Debo was in and out and you know wh whatever it it comes to. I I do think they have a Super Bowl hangover. It could be partly a some of it could be a Kyle hangover. You know one of the things that could be an issue is with the players. How do you think the they feel when they heard Kansas City uh, players all knew the overtime rules for the Super Bowl, and they awesome. weren't even in, they weren't even informed. More, I mean, more evidence to have the players doubt Kyle. Like I yes, said, I, I think they lo he lost a lot of respect in in the Super Bowl with that, and he still denied it after the game. Yeah, he's not going to. Yeah, it's like, oh no, we we. It, I mean, the fact was is that. Kyle has a little bit of Farhan in him in that he th thinks he's too smart for his own well-being that he's like oh I I can over I can do it this way and you know I'm going to show you how it's done uh, you know I mean Kyle has come within one play of each Super Bowl of being Super Bowl champs. I mean, you think about the third and 15 play to Tyreek Hill where Boza got, you know, held like crazy and they didn't call it, but 
that play doesn't go down, the 49ers stop them. They win the Super Bowl that year. And last year, Super Bowl, the missed assignment by Burford in overtime. That's a touchdown to Ayuk. <sighs> and then Kansas City maybe still wins. Maybe they have to come down and score as they did. But I think it it's a little bit different feeling when you're up a full touchdown versus a field goal. I mean, Niners had many opportunities to win. So in, in many ways, we're saying Kyle may not be the guy. I think what we're really saying here is that maybe it's starting to wear the the the, the time he's been the coach and the opportunities and that the guys they've signed to big contracts, it almost – to me, feels like they're in a window of this year where they either put it together and make this incredible late run or it just completely falls apart. Hey, you know what? And it may not be a bad move for Kyle. He looks so worn down. He looks old. He looks tired. I haven't seen the guy laugh or smile at all in any of his press conference. He's feeling it. He's wearing down. So, you know, it may not be the the bad, uh, worst thing for him to start fresh and go to a whole new organization and then take over there. You know, one of the things that I think is not talked about either is, you know, Kyle's choices for, for assistant coaches. Like we have maybe the worst special teams coordinator in football. Our defensive coordinator is guy looks like Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Like I can't take him serious. I'm, I can't waiting take, for, I'm waiting for him to show up at a, at, a, at, a, at a press conference with a fat blunt in his mouth. I just can't take the organization. Totally, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. I know what I'm going to call on defense this week. <laughs> yeah, classic, I can't, I can't classic take, movie, by the way. I can't take Kyle and, and John serious. I, I told Dan this earlier today. Like, the way that the special teams has been, it's already cost them one, maybe two games. And then every game they've had a gaffe of some kind to the point where it's pushed, put the team back or put them in a hole or cause them to potentially lose or cause them to lose. And someone's head's got to roll. Like, even if it's not the, the, the coordinator's fault, someone's head has to roll and he has, he won't fire him because he was his buddy. Right. It's so, his buddy. Roster so he's politics. Fire him. One on my not, list. He's not going to fire him. And then, the fact that Ronnie Bell is still on the roster blows my mind. The yeah. guy cost you a game, right? He hasn't caught a ball. Like, he's caught a couple of balls. I'm saying, like, he's been dropping balls all year. He dropped balls in the preseason. He wasn't that good last year. Like Larry said, you either have to have good ball skills as a wide receiver or you got to be fast as shit. And he's neither. So right. the fact that he's still on the roster when there are better options – on other teams' practice squads, on your own practice squad, just tells me that they are not ready to admit their mistake. You drafted him too high. He's a yep. bust. Yep. Fail fast. Cut your losses. Don't compound your mistake by playing this guy or having him on your roster. Improve your team. And I can't take him seriously because those two guys are still in the organization. So that's just my opinion. But What's the definition of insanity? Yeah, doing the same thing over and over and thinking, expecting, expecting a different, different results. results. Yeah, I, I, so I can't take him serious. My I eye, te a, my eye test tells me that Cowing is going to be a better player than Pearsall. The fourth rounder will be better than the first rounder. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a first I, round I, pick. They, they're not real good at picking first rounds. So yeah, he, Pearsall is probably not that good. I did a a he's little deal. Out, but I did a little good. deal last night. I was playing around. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna. Sports is all about evolving, you know. Things change. I had Brock Purdy as one of my higher-rated quarterbacks in the top 10, even close to top five. Might have been top five earlier this year after the Rams game. But what do you think of this list right here? This is my top I, – I ranked all 32 quarterbacks. Um, You know, I know Mahomes is not having the best season, and maybe Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen are – or better than him right now, but he just wins. And so I, and, and and part of this list is I did this in mind thinking of who would I want running the 49ers, whether it's, you know, a, as a 49 So what do you think of this list? I got, you can see it there. Mahomes one, Allen, Jack Lamar, 
CJ Stroud, Burrow, Jordan Love, Jaden Daniels, Goff, Stafford, Herbert, Murray, Purdy at 12, Prescott, Caleb Williams, Kirk Cousins, Jalen Hurts, Trevor Lawrence, Darnold, Mayfield, Aaron Rodgers, 21, Tua, Carr, 22, Geno Smith, Drake Mays, Justin Fields, and yeah. Wilson, Daniel Jones, Will Levis, Bo Nix, Minshew, Anthony Richardson, who's ever quarterback in Cleveland, and then Bryce. <laughs> Bryce Young. I, I mean, feel like, yeah, I feel like you have, in my opinion, Purdy's too too low. Um, I would rather have Purdy running the offense with a better with a different coach. You think uh, Purdy should be somewhere around eight? So, I I think Baker Mayfield should be higher as well. Yeah, I, playing well. I got May Mayfield at nineteen. Okay. Yeah. Um. um and let's see, Allen's good. I, I don't – I know he's probably going to get the third MVP. I'm not a fan of Lamar Jackson. I don't think he can throw the football. He's a no, he, freak athletically. He but, threw it well last night, man. He threw it well last night. He has own games. He also chokes like a mofo every single playoffs. So yeah. until he wins a quality playoff game, yeah, he, he's dead to me in, in that regard. Purdy's already had a significantly better postseason record and postseason play than the three-time – supposed soon-to-be three-time MVP. So I'm not a fan of Lamar Jackson. I don't think he can throw the football. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Justin Herbert. I think he has all the measurables to be a, an ideal quarterback, size, arm strength, placement of the ball, but he does not win. I've seen yeah, him many, win. I've seen him many, many, many times down three, down seven. To me, one of the big things that I rate a quarterback is can you bring a team, go the length of the field, and win a game at the end of the game? And and I, I have not seen that in Justin Herbert at all lately. And, or, and, and I could yet. I could I could bring Brock up a little bit, but after Sunday's game, some of the decision making, I just was like, "What are you doing?" You know, with the 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 he had two. A bad game. He had yeah, a bad he had a bad game. He had a bad game. Yeah. But and and, and he's I, I, he, I'm he is a top. You know, he's on the top half of the quarterback list. And you've seen and him play I, good in the Super Bowl, and you've seen him play yeah, good in the playoffs. I mean, I can I can. I would be fine putting him in seven or eight position as well. I, I put some of these guys ahead of him based on raw talent, you know, like Jaden Daniels looking at him, but Jaden Daniels hasn't proven anything yet. You know, he, he's proven he, he, he can win in, you know, five games so far and he, and, and he's, he's, he's good, but we'll see how long does that last? Does the league figure certain guys out? But my question on for you guys is this, Brock Purdy, do you sign Brock Purdy to an extension this offseason, or do you let him play out his fourth year? And if you do that, would you draft a – let's say you're in the draft this year and next year, and – Cam Ward of Miami is available. Do you, oh, I I do that in a minute. Do you I want take the a, Niners. I want the Niners to draft a quarterback this draft somewhere. So and you're I, not going to sign Purdy to a 40, 50 plus million extension? No. No. That would just be that would just be another high contract. We're complaining about all these contracts we've given. And how double standard would that be if we're like, God, why'd they give this guy money? Why'd this guy give this guy money? And then we go ahead and give Purdy. And I like Purdy a lot, a lot. But he has some limitations um, that keep him from being an elite quarterback. He's a very good quarterback, in my opinion. But he is not elite. Um, you know, people talk about arm strength, and it's not just about how far you can throw the ball, but it's velocity. You notice the Niners don't throw a lot of out routes. Everything is towards the middle of the field on timing basis. That's Kyle's offense. But that limits you. When you can't use every inch of grass on the football field and the defense knows it, then you're limited on what you can do. I'm talking about that 20, 25-yard out pattern. That takes a strong arm to get that on a line and get it there before the corner breaks on it and makes a play on it. Um, Purdy's arm is, I think, average to above average. Um, and that's not a knock on him because some of the best quarterbacks of all time didn't have the best arms. Um, but the other thing that people that th think forget about is Brock hasn't exactly played very well in bad weather. 
Uh, he's got like three games that he's not played well. So I don't know if his hand uh, hand size is small and he can't grip the ball in the snow or rain. But if he has to go on the road, let's see how he plays at Green Bay and at uh, Buffalo back to back. I'm very curious to see how he plays in those games. All right. So let's just take a look from 2000 on. And there's a couple of exceptions. But the question is, do you need an elite quarterback to win the Super Bowl? And since 2000, here is the list. Starting St. Louis, Kurt Warner. Okay. Uh, Baltimore won with a great defense. And Trent Dilfer. Trent Dilfer. Okay. Not elite. There's one. Out of okay, so we're gonna have 24 or 25 numbers here. Brady one in 02. Tampa, that's another not an elite quarterback, but an amazing defense. The quarterback was what Brad Johnson? Yep. Okay, and then Brady Brady, and then Ben Roethlisberger in 06, Manning in 07, uh Eli Manning in 08. Not a great quarterback. Not a great quarterback. Back to Roethlisberger, then Drew Brees, then Aaron Rodgers, then Eli Manning again, and then it was uh, Joe Flacco, Flacco, then Russell Wilson, Brady, Peyton Manning, Brady. uh, who, who filled in for uh, Nick was, Foles? Nick Foles, that's right. Nick Foles. After they fired um, Andy Reid. Right. Nick Foles. And then it was Brady, and then Mahomes, and then Brady, and then Stafford, and then Brady, Brady. I mean, not Brady. Brady, and, and then Stafford, and then Mahomes, Mahomes. So about four instances with Baltimore winning two Super Bowls without great quarterbacks. Tampa, the Giants won a couple that I, I kind of put Brock in Eli Manning territory. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good analogy. He's a, he's a good quarterback. And in, in, in some cases, he's a very good quarterback. But uh, Eli Manning has never been, um, you know, called a great quarterback. He's had great defenses that helped him win those Super Bowls. Uh, so I, I think Brock needs – um, supporting pieces around him in order to win that Super Bowl. Um, and that's fine. But he's not elite. And that's why I wouldn't give him 50 to 60 million. That just, yeah. Because you give him that with all the contracts they have right now, our depth is already bad. Our depth is going to be even worse. And it's just, it's going to take a long time to recover right. if you give him that money. What do you think the single biggest mistake the Niners? have made in the last two, three years? The last two or three years? I have one in my mind, and I'm wondering if 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 you have, if it's the same. Passing, on, think, Brady, passing on Brady was how long ago? Uh, the three year years ago? After, three, four years. After the 20, was it the 20... 20 season after after, the 19th? after they lost to the Rams in the NFC championship, it was 21. And I think Brady was a free agent then. And then Tampa won it. Right. So it was 22. Uh, Tampa won it in uh, 21. It was after the COVID year. It okay. was no, 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 no. Wait, it was after they, they lost to Kansas city in, in the Super Bowl, the first time. And then Brady left New England and signed with Tampa, but he wanted to come to San Francisco, but because the Niners were coming off of a Super Bowl, Kyle wanted to keep Jimmy. <laughs> to wow. me, I mean that's that's about three years ago. I mean that's about that's that's four or five years ago, but four years ago. Here's mine. Here's my number one mistake. They signed. They were so excited the first right out of the gate free agent. They signed Javon uh, Hargrove, and they had to because of that contract. They got rid of Jimmy Ward. They got rid of some of their 
Ebicom. Ebicom. Al-Shair. Al-Shair. All that depth had to leave. And he's never been a good run stopper. He's They got him because they loved the fact that he got, what, eight sacks or something like that for Philly from up the middle. They could have just kept DJ Jones. Or they could have kept DeForest Buckner, who was a run stopper and a pass rusher. And, and let Armstead go that year instead of uh, Buckner. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's the better player. So but That was a huge mistake. That was a huge gamble on a guy that is limited on doing one thing, rushing the passer. DJ Jones right. is awesome. Yeah. So they should trade for DJ Jones right now. They should. They should trade for DJ Jones and they should try to go after a team that is in the dumps and make them an offer. Would you? I would. I would do this personally, but I don't think Tampa Bay would do it or a team like that. But for a player like Tristan Worse, Worse, would you trade a one and a and a three or a four? They're not trading Tristan Worse. No, I know they're not. They oh. won't do that, of course. I'm just saying, if a player that was, let's say the, let's say Worse was on um, Carolina, or you know, and they- obviously, yeah, I'm at a, I'm at a point personally where I think the Niners' window has closed to win a Super Bowl. Can they make the playoffs? Yeah. But I don't want to give up any more draft picks. I I want to accumulate draft picks, and I want to build, and and you know rebuild this team Sutton. and rebuild this roster. What's that? They're going to trade picks for Sutton. Well, that's going to be a mistake. Because, Huge mistake. Huge yeah, mistake. They're, they're going to they're going to trade and, and picks. Don't, don't go after Sutton if you're going to get a receiver. Get somebody that can that can go deep. Go after like a Christian Kirk or something. From Jacksonville, that that's a guy that's we'll get two two at well, yeah. Somebody like that. Don't go get no somebody that's not going to cost you a second or third. Go get. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, but the problem is, is you trade for one of those receivers, you still have the same coach calling the plays. True. You still have the same offensive line that can't hold up to hit a deep ball. You still got McKivitz and you still got Brendo who cannot block against. Top end defensive talent. So, so, so the team needs you're, you're giving up picks to basically stay stay about the same. You're, you, that's not going to put you over the top. Let me ask you this: in the off season, let's say the Niners either don't make the playoffs or they bow out early. Maybe they win one game in, at home and then they lose in the division round. Yeah, we talked about trading. Kyle, for a couple of good picks, high picks, you get that. Would you trade anybody else on this roster like yes. a Nick Boza, a Debo? I, I would a, trade Nick Boza. I would very much trade Debo. I would yeah. cut Ayuk. Now, cutting Ayuk, I, I thought about that too, and I don't have a problem with that. I just don't, I just don't know what the cap hit would be if it's way too much. Or, but Ayuk basically you signed for four years. You're not going to, he's gone this year and you're probably not going to get much production if he comes back next year late no. in the season. So you're really looking at the last two years of Ayuk. And would, what ahead. are you going to get out of him? What would you do? I would consider trading Trent Williams too. He's up there in age. Somebody will give up something for him to plug in a. You know, still got a year left maybe of being a, a really good offensive left tackle to put them over the top and win a Super Bowl. I don't know if you get a first-round pick for him, but, boy, that, that'd be $25 million off the books. And, hey, use these draft picks to pick offensive tackles for a damn change. They're out there. Every year, good offensive linemen come out, and every year the Niners just go. We got to take a wide receiver. Let them go by. We got to take a wide receiver. We got to take Ricky Pearsall, a fourth string wide receiver, over a center or a right tackle. Do you remember when Jim Harbaugh uh, came stupid. in? What, what was their first two picks in the two? It was either 2010 Mike or 11. E, Mike U. Potty and Anthony Davis. First two picks in the first guard, round. A dominant guard and a dominant right tackle. Love yep. it. Harbaugh uh, emphasizes the offensive line. As he did this year. Didn't he get Slater? He got uh, Joe Alt. No, Ott. He got Alt. He got Alt. 
Yep. First, yeah, that's first round pick, a dominant tackle. Yeah, a dominant tackle with a fifth or sixth pick in the draft. Yeah. Yep. In uh, eight in eight years, the Niners have drafted um, McGlinchey as a top pick. Who else? Uh, Banks was a second round pick. Second round pick. Tony was a third round pick. That's eight years, guys. That Tony's they've addressed not all of them. At eight years of drafts, they've drafted three wasted top three pick, not wasted, used three top picks. Uh, maybe going after McGlinchey and that not working um, scared them. And that's why they thought, oh, we don't have to draft a first round yeah. guy. Yeah. Maybe because they, but it's like, just because you miss doesn't mean like you stop doing that for the rest of, you know, yeah. your career here. You know what I mean? Exactly. Mistakes happen. Yeah. Final you missed, thoughts. You missed a lot on wide receivers, and what did you do? You still drafted Ricky right. Pearsall, right? Right. Yeah. Pearsall, I'm hoping can. He just be... feels more. He feels more comfortable because he was a wide receiver. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, Pearsall's yeah, mo coming out of the draft was he can't get off of press coverage, which is exactly what they had problems with in Kansas City. That was his mo. Like he's good against zones. Great. We have guys that are great against zones. We need a guy that can. Get off of man coverage, and it's going to be Jacob Cowing. If he's given a chance, watch. He's going to have a good game yeah. someday. All right. Any any final thoughts for either of you guys? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is going to be a hot topic, and this is going to be a very controversial one, and most of the fan base is going to push back. They don't want to see Kyle go. They're paranoid about thinking about who could possibly come in. They don't just believe that there are other smart coaches in the league. Nobody knew who the head coach of, of the Vikings really was. Was it O'Donnell or O'Connell? O'Connell. Like, like not too many people Kevin knew O'Connell. about his resume. He was a offensive coordinator for the Rams, wasn't he? And he's a very smart coach. There are a lot of coaches other than Ben Johnson that with this talent could come in. And I'm telling you, if you hear a different voice and you tweak one thing, you never know. Mark Jackson was a, Mark Jackson was a pretty damn good coach, and Kerr came in and instead of using pick and rolls, he used a motion offense. So that one little tweak with the same roster put the Warriors over the top, and so who, that's all it will take. Nobody knew who Steve Kerr was. The guy was working for TV, right? Yeah, he also you just never know with coaches. Yeah, he also had a really good roster too. Who who would you um, Bingo. who would you take for or who would you? In, install as your defensive coordinator I bring back Sala. yeah ben I johnson think. and sala i like that combination Woo! sounds good you know I ben like johnson's that. a hot commodity right now but let's say you can't get him somebody else jumps and beat you to it and you and you just traded kyle for some picks who who else is out there that Sounds like would be a you know you all you also could go with you know I kind of like what Detroit did they went with a defensive minded uh, total motivator in Dan Campbell and then he's got the he's got Ben Johnson running the offense you know uh, sometimes well, if, that's the, if that's the case then maybe Brian Flores as a defensive minded coach I don't and I don't think. I don't think having a defensive minded head coach is a winning strategy. I think you either have to have a raw, raw type coach like Dan Campbell and you have right. a guy running the offense and a guy running the defense, or you have to have an offensive head coach. I agree. Cause the offensive coordinators I think you're better off too. get, get coached too often. And then you got to yeah. start yeah. all over again. Like it's kind of, it's working with, with D'Amico Ryan's it is, but. Would you try and go get steel Lincoln Riley from USC? No, no, not good. Not not. Did Did you see Ben Johnson throw a hook and lateral up thirty against Dallas? <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of coach I want. I want coaches that step on your throat, yeah, and want to destroy yeah. you, not let you hang around, which is what Kyle has done. His well, you, now, I, I'm, I wonder about that too because you think that was all Ben Johnson, or you think that was a lot of Dan Campbell saying we get the opportunity bury these guys. Uh, both, maybe both, but but a of both. And trust me, when Detroit plays the Niners, because Detroit absolutely feels like they were the better team in the NFC right. Championship. When they come here, uh, best believe it, Detroit's gonna put it 
<laughs> they're going to run up the scoreboard on the Niners in that game, depending on who's healthy and everything like that. Can't wait to bet that game. Yeah, because the Niners will be favored despite not. Oh being yeah, a better I team. bet the Chiefs. I bet the Chiefs on Sunday. I knew they were going to lose. Easy money. I knew the Niners were going to lose. Easy money. Remember, I told you on that last show. I was like, I don't yeah. know about this one, boys. I, I I picked the Niners in my on 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 the show, but I in my in my weekly pick 'em pool, I took the Chiefs. I you know, I I took the Chiefs. But let me ask you this: What did you guys think? And we'll, we'll, we'll finish up here. What did you guys think of Kansas City up twenty-one to twelve on the one yard line with what six, seven minutes to go in the game, roughly five minutes, six minutes, whatever it was in the game. And they got third and down and they run the play <laughs> that they beat the Niners on in the Super Bowl. As a Niner well, fan, I, as a Niner fan, I didn't like it, but as a football fan, I loved it. Is that the ultimate like I'm going to kick you when you're down? Yep. Like I am just going to step on your throat right now and show you up that we own you. I got no problem with that. And no, I, I, I'm not I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. I'm just saying, is is that's the kind of mentality. I think you want in a coach yeah. that says, I don't, we're not playing footsies here. We're playing up, you know, shove it up your, you know what, football. Andy Reid ran a fake punt in his own territory against the yeah. Niners. You would think that Andy Reid was the guy that was 0-4 and desperate to beat Kyle, but it was the other way around. Kyle will never fake punt. He'll never fake field goal. And he'll never do an onside kick when you least expect it. He's soft, That's dude. not in his genes. He's That's, soft. You, you got to have balls to do to make He's plays soft. like that as a coach. The team is he soft. He will never do that. He didn't even go for a two point conversion when they were down fourteen to twelve. So again, that's not his nature, and he never will be. So he, yeah, you got to get that killer instinct that and stop getting too brainiac with everything. Yep. You got to have that, you know, that mindset of. And and I think I don't know what it is. My guess is that it's fear. Of what? Fear. Failure. There's fear of failing instead of I don't care if I fail. I'm going to go out and give it everything, and I'm going to lay it all on the line. The, we've seen it maybe twice in his eight years. We saw it against New Orleans when they won 48. 45, 48, 46, whatever that score was when uh, there was just a shootout down in New Orleans. 48, uh, 46, I think. Something like that, yeah. And then the uh, – I'm trying to remember. There was one other game that we saw him uh, – Philly last year. Yeah, Philly last year. It, they just stepped on the gas. 48, 46. Yeah. December 8, 2019. Yeah. Well, like like Sean said earlier, he doesn't have any feel for the flow of a game. He has an offensive coordinator's mindset. When he's up, he feels like he has to score points, not realizing that just as important, if not more, is you got to use clock. And that's why he continuously in third or fourth quarters where he has leads, he passes, 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 clock stops, holding calls. Hey, when you pass the ball – there's more likely to be a penalty than when you run the ball. That's just a fact. Of course. You don't see a lot of offensive holdings on running plays like you do on passing plays. Because when you run, you're giving uh you're going forward. When you're passing, you're back and you're protecting. So and I and I always bring bring this up. The 81 NFC championship. I know I brought it up before, but Dallas was up by six and they went with a six DBs against the Niners. And what did Bill Walsh do? He ran, ran it, ran it, ran it, ran it. Five of eight plays, he ran the ball down the field because he took what the defense was giving him. Kyle calls all of his plays. He doesn't know what the defense is. Uh, he, he, that's, you, that's the arrogance. He calls the play thinking it's going to work no matter what defense is played. Right. That, that's what happened in the Rams NFC Championship game. Remember the Niners always used to run the ball right down the Rams' throat every yes. game. They kept beating them. 
So what the Rams did in that game is they brought two safeties up in the box, and they said, we're not going to let you do that. And Kyle didn't adjust. He kept doing insanity, doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. He kept running into an eight, nine-man line. Right? Lowe's. I mean, Lowe's. Would, yeah. If his name was Kyle Dickinson, would he still have his job today? No. He would be fired. I think York, I think York would be able to fire him. York loves him because he's paranoid about the coaches that preceded him, and he's afraid right. to go back to that. And that's why, even if they miss the playoffs, I doubt if York would fire him. Yeah, I know Eddie. He, I know Eddie would. He's got the, you know, the Shanahan. You know, he's he got, came from the Mike Shanahan tree. Mike Shanahan won a Super Bowl with the Niners as the offensive coordinator in '94. Won a couple of Super Bowls with Denver in what '97, '98, whatever those years were uh, with Elway. Uh, Even the great Bill Belichick, who has a hell of a lot more hardware hardware than Kyle Shanahan does and has a name, was not renewed. And when he interviewed for other <laughs> coaching jobs, he was turned down as well. So if they can stonewall Bill Belichick, they can stonewall Kyle Shanahan. Wow. Resume is a way, way longer. Well, guys, uh, before we get out of here, I want to thank our sponsor for this show, and that is Chapman Law Group. Chapman Law Group in Marin is a sponsor of the show, and we want to give them a shout out. If you need any legal needs, legal matters, just give Chapman Law Group a call at 415-613-9483. They're in Marin. They service the entire Bay Area, but they also are licensed and serve all of California. So any legal needs, just give Chapman Law Group a call, 415-613-9483. Let them know that NorCal Sports Network gave you a call. And also, if you're in the Bay Area and you're wanting some yogurt, give our friends over at Yogurt Shack a call. Yogurt Shack is located in Danville and in Lafayette. They have two locations to serve you, uh, downtown Danville, right on Hearts Avenue, and in Lafayette on Mount Diablo Boulevard, right off of the 24 Freeway. Get, give them a try. Uh, yogurt Shack is. And, guys, the last thing is we want to say is uh, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button to this show. We are growing channel. We've been known for covering Giants baseball. And our subs are approaching 2,600. But we're not just a baseball channel. That's why it's called NorCal Sports Network. It doesn't have the San Francisco Giants in its name. We cover all of the NorCal sports teams, except we'll never cover the Valkyrie on this channel. I don't care how much you pay me. I'm not doing WNBA <laughs> basketball, okay? Um, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I just realized I was yesterday years old that I found out that their finals is best two out of three. Oh gosh. Did you I, know that? Did you guys know that? No, I didn't. I didn't watch any of it. I didn't. I paid two no out attention. of three for their finals. Yeah. <laughs> the Liberty, the, the New York team won two games and they're, they're celebrating. Yeah. I was just, it was on TV at the restaurant I was in and it had like New York up one or it was the series tied one to one. I was like, oh, okay, well, it's an overtime. Of, you know, there, there'll be a couple more games. You know, and then I started, like storming the court and celebrating. I was like, wait, what? What? If I on? was, if I had a masonry business, I would advertise for the WNBA and say, you know, we lay better bricks than these guys. You Perfect. Know, uh, Perfect. <laughs> just like, come on. It's a I joke should... product. They and and side note, they still lost forty million this year. Yeah. Even, even after having all of the excitement and and you know around Caitlin Clark and yeah. all the, the she, she's eyeballs. she's great she's great she's but phenomenal they, all the extra eyeballs and yeah. all the extra ticket sales they still lost money still you know, lost forty million it's an inferior what a product you know if I was commissioner of the WNBA the first thing I would do look I'll give you I'll give them a tip their players are about a foot shorter than the NBA players your three point line is shorter distance you use a lighter smaller ball why not lower the basket 
to nine feet. You might have some entertainment value mm -hmm. with people actually being able to, you know, they're, they look like they're, you know, I've seen fourth and fifth graders trying to struggle to get the ball up. You know, when they're down low, I've seen a couple of bricks thrown up. They just can't shoot down there. How about an eight and a half, nine foot hoop? Maybe see some of those ladies go up and that would be entertaining yep. to see some lady go up there and tomahawk a dunk. That would be worth it. But, uh, anyway, guys, we're going to get out of here. Um, catch us later tonight after the Warriors game against Portland. We'll be on at 8.30 approximately, or excuse me, 9.30, approximately 9.30 tonight. Warriors post game show against uh, after they play the Portland Trailblazers in Portland. So about 930 tonight, catch us back on here. We want to thank you for being part of NorCal sports and uh, let me find my music. Here we go. Hey. Golden state warriors post game show. 9.30. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs>